it is sure good to get to meet some people that I don't have to confront with wickedness this morning. Since some of you might not recognize me, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. I was called by God to be a prophet in 860 B.C. But while I am spoken of in the Bible in several chapters, so one thing they don't tell me much about in the Bible is about my ancestor or age. And you think you might feel old. Think of how old I am. The Bible doesn't talk much about my age, but that's not too strange. I've talked to women that won't tell you what their age is either. So as you can see, old age is starting to creep up with me. But you'd look old also if you had to confront several kings with their wickedness. Oh, well, that's right, you don't have a king, you have a president. Well, very few people have ever heard of the little town that I was born and raised in. I was born and raised in a little town called Tishbe, which is located in the land of Gilead. About the only thing that the Bible specifically states about me is that I usually wore a special type of clothing that only we prophets wear. I usually wear an old-looking mantle that is woven of goat hair and, and has a leather belt around it. But I dressed up today in my Sunday go to meet robe. And my other one, I didn't want to wear that today. But most of the robes that I wear, they're like a blanket. They extend the whole way down to the floor. And, and, uh, but you can see that this cloak of mine today, that, that's not my normal cloak. This is, this is my Sunday go to meet cloak. Let me tell you a little bit about the nation whose leaders... I was sent to confront. I was raised in a very morally corrupt nation. My nation was so corrupt that people actually killed their children as sacrifices to pagan gods. Let me give you an example. A military leader named Joshua. He promised that if anyone tried to rebuild the city of Jericho, that they would be cursed. Joshua promised that anyone who tried to rebuild the city of Jericho would lose his two sons in the process. Well, it sure does seem that man is continually testing God. Hillel, who was from the city of Bethel, well, he rebuilt Jericho. He laid its foundation at the cost of his oldest son, Abiram, and he set up the gates at the cost of his youngest son, Segev, just like God said was going to happen. You know that everything that God says is going to happen is going to happen. Yes. The northern king of Israel to which I was sent never experienced any degree of stability until the reign of King Omri, who came to power in 885 BC. He started to reign almost 50 years after the division of the two nations. You might remember in the days of Rehoboam that he tried to increase the taxes so much that the kingdom split. The northern ten tribes became the nation Israel, and the southern two tribes became the, the nation Judah. Well, I was sent to confront several kings, one in writing to the kings of Judah and the other ones to the, two na to the nation of Israel. Well, Omri did a lot of good. He brought prosperity into the northern kingdom. He also did evil in the eyes of God more than all the other kings that had preceded him. Perhaps the most evil thing he did was he introduced into the land of Israel the pagan idols that were north of the land of Israel. Ahab's son, Ahab, uh, Omri's son, Ahab, who became king in 874 B.C., even married Jezebel, who was the daughter of Ethbaal, the king of the Sidonites. Now, I know why Omri encouraged his son to marry this wicked woman named Jezebel. They formed an alliance between the nation of Israel and the, and the, uh, the Phoenicians, who lived north of them. But boy, was Jezebel one wicked woman. She was a strong-willed woman who was a fervent worshiper of Baal, who never missed an opportunity to promote Baal inside the land of Israel. Through this political marriage between King Ahab and Queen Jezebel, Jezebel was able to bring about spiritual disaster inside the land of Israel. The worship of the idol Baal gained a great foothold inside the land of Israel thanks to the wicked woman named Queen Jezebel. During this time of great apostasy, which was around 860 B.C., inside the nation of Israel, that God called me to confront a very powerful couple. This couple had turned the hearts of the Israelites away from God and unto the idols of Baal and Asherah. Yes, I was sent by God to confront the most powerful person inside the entire land of Israel. Could you imagine going into Washington, D.C. this morning and walking up to President Joe Biden and his wife and 
confronting them with their wickedness and telling them that they needed to turn back to God? Well, that's what my mission was. That's what God sent me to do. God called me to confront several kings with their wickedness. God never said life was going to be easy. My name Elijah means my God is the Lord. And as the Lord, God called the shots in my life. And that's what he's supposed to do in your life. He's supposed to call the shots in your life. Oh, yeah, where was I in my story? Oh, yeah, God sent me into Ahab and Jezebel's palace to confront them with their wickedness. I was shaking in my shoes, but I knew that God had called me to do this. And so I walked right into their palace in Samaria. And I told King Ahab a message that I knew was not going to be a popular message. You see, folks, God wants us to tell people his message, whether it's popular or not. We need to tell people what they need to hear rather than what they want to hear. Amen. So there I was confronting the most powerful man inside the entire nation of Israel. My message was very simple. I told King Ahab, the God that I serve has sent me to tell you that there isn't going to be any dew or any rain except at my word for the next couple of years. Now keep in mind, according to the worshipers of Baal, Baal was the god, small g, that provided the land with rain. That wasn't the being that God said provides the land with rain. We know that it's the Lord God that sends rain. Job chapter 5 verse 10 says God bestows rain on the earth. He sends water upon the world, upon the countryside. Job 36 verses 26 and 27 says how great is our God beyond all human understanding. He draws up the drops of water which distills as rain into the streams. God had promised the Jewish nation under, uh, under Moses that if they, if they turned their backs on him, that he would, if, he would, if they served him, that he would send rain in its season. But God also promised the nation of Israel that he would turn the sky to bronze, he would turn the rain into dust and make the ground as hard as iron if they turned their backs on him. God was about to withhold all the rain from the land of Israel to bring the people of Israel back to himself. Through my words, God was declaring war upon the idol named Baal. Now the people of Israel, they should have known who was going to win this war. God had declared war on the gods of Egypt centuries earlier when he sent ten plagues upon that nation to show his superiority over those, those ten ten uh, different gods. Yes, sir, there was coming a mighty showdown between Baal and God. And God was about to king show King Ahab and all the Israelites who really was in control of rain. God was about to attack Baal at his strongest point. Baal claimed to be the storm god. But the Lord God was about to demonstrate that he, not Baal, is in control of rainfall. And if I told Ahab what was about to happen to Israel, I got out of there really quick. My mama didn't raise me a fool. Shortly after I delivered the message, God told me to go east and hide in the Cherith Ravine, which is located to the east of the Jordan River. God promised me that he would provide me with water from a little brook there and that he would use the ravens to give me bread and, and meat every morning and every evening. Again, this isn't the first time that God did such a thing. In the midst of dry conditions, you might remember that God provided the Israelites with water and with manna and with quail when they were in their wilderness wanderings. But as the drought began to linger on, the little brook that I was getting my water from began to dry up. I mean, things were getting dry. You know how crunchy it gets underneath your feet when you're, you're walking out in your front yard in July or August and the, and the the grass just kind of crunches beneath your feet. Multiply that by 100. And you got how dry the entire country and the land of Israel had become because Israel had turned its back on God. Well, as my water supply was now gone, God told me to immediately go to Zarephath, which is in Sidon, and to stay there. Because God had commanded a widow there to supply me with food. And so I did what God said. I, I went to Zarephath. And sure enough, as I walked into the gates of the city, there was this widow gathering sticks. 
Now, if you want to hear about the rest of that story, you've got to come back because your preacher told me that he's going to be preaching on this in the next couple of weeks. Well, I'd tell you about the miracle that God did with this widow's son, but again, I don't want to steal the, the thunder from your pastor's sermon in the next couple of weeks. Well, after this drought and the resulting famine had entered into its third year, God told me, he said, go to King Ahab again and tell him that rain is going to come. And as I was going to present myself before King Ahab, little did I know it, but King Ahab and, his, and Obadiah, who was in charge of the palace in Samaria, they were out searching for green pasture for the livestock because it was so dry. Obadiah, just in case you don't know who he was, he was a devout believer in the Lord who had secretly hidden a hundred prophets that, in two caves, and he had supplied them with food and water while Ahab and Queen Jezebel were trying to wipe out all the true prophets in the land of Israel. Well, during this search for green pasture, King Ahab went one direction and, and Obadiah went the other. When King Ahab and I met, he accused me of bringing this disaster upon the land of Israel. Well, I made sure to set the record straight. I told him point blank, it wasn't me that brought this about. It was you and your family. You and your family are the ones that abandoned the Lord's commands and followed Baal. I then challenged him to a contest on Mount Carmel. I told him that to gather the 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah and bring them to the top of Mount Carmel. King Ahab, he accepted my offer. We went to the top of Mount Carmel. I told all the people of Israel that they needed to stop wavering back and forth in their relationship with God. I told him, I said, if God is the Lord, then follow God. But if Baal's the Lord, follow Baal. Their response overwhelmed me. I couldn't believe it. They didn't say anything. They just stood there. So the contest went on. The contest I proposed involved the sacrifice of two bulls. The 450 prophets of Baal were to build a large campfire and then sacrifice their bull up top of it. Then they were called to call upon Baal and ask him to light the fire. I'd do the same thing, but the difference was I would saturate the campfire with water. I told the, I didn't, ex, I didn't uh, think it, at the time it was too smart of an idea, but I wanted people to realize that it was definitely God that lit that fire. So the 450 prophets of Baal, they built their campfire, their sacrifice, their bull up top of it, and then they started to cry out to Baal and ask him to light the fire. When the fire remained unlit, they began to dance around the sacrifice, and they started to cut themselves with knives. This went on until the time of the evening sacrifice. I mean, it went on 8, 10, 12 hours. I don't know exactly how long this went. We didn't have time at watches back in those days like we do today. The prophets of Baal never did get their fire lit. Then it was my turn. I took 12 stones, and I rebuilt the altar unto the Lord. I dug, I dug a trench out around the altar and had people fill four large jars of water. Then they dumped the water on the wood and the sacrifice. I told them, said, do it again. They did it a second time. I told them, do it again. They did it a third time. Until the water ran all over the altar and began to fill the trench that I had dug that surrounded the altar. I then said these words to God in prayer. I said, O oh Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you alone are God in Israel and that I am your servant and I have done these things at your command. Answer me, O Lord, answer me so that these people will know that you, O Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. I no sooner got those words out of my mouth and the fire of God fell and it burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the soil, even the water that was in the trench. At that point, all the people of Israel fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. I then commanded the people of Israel to seize the prophets of Baal. We took them down to the Kishon Valley and we executed them there. After these false prophets were executed, I climbed back up on the top of Mount Carmel and I started to pray. Seven times I prayed, Lord, send rain. Now that the people have seen that you are God. Seven times, the number seven is the number of perfection of God. And so the seventh time, 
God began to answer my prayer. I then told Ahab, King Ahab, I said, get back down. He said, the rain's getting ready to come. The sky began to grow black. The wind rose, the heavy wind, the heavy rain came. The drought and the famine were finally over. I outran Ahab's chariot that day the whole way to Jezreel, which was where King Ahab's winter palace was. Well, I totally expected there would be a great revival come about. They had seen the fire of God fall from the sky. That didn't just happen. But I'll tell you what did happen. I went into one of the darkest seasons of my entire life. When King Ahab and Queen told Queen Jezebel that I'd killed all her prophets, she vowed that she was going to kill me the next day. I don't know what happened, but I lost my courage that day. I had a lapse in my faith that day. When I found out that Queen Jezebel's plans were to execute me, I ran for my life. When I came to Beersheba in Judah, I told my servant, you stay here. And I ran for another day out into the desert. I finally stopped running as I came to a broom tree. I sat down under the tree, and I prayed that I might die. I told the Lord, I said, I've had enough war. Take my life. I'm no better than any of my other ancestors. Don't ever kid yourself. If you think that God's people can't hit rock bottom and even contemplate suicide at times. Then I lay down under the broom, broom tree and I fell asleep. I mean, I was absolutely exhausted. Who wouldn't be? I had ran over 100 miles. I didn't have my own car. I didn't have a bicycle. We didn't have any of those things. They weren't even invented yet. But God sent an angel to minister to me. The angel said, get up and eat. And I looked around me, and there by my head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. I ate, I drank, and I lay back down again. The angel of the Lord came to me a second time. He touched me and said, get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So I got up and ate and drank again. Strengthened by that food, I traveled 40 days and 40 nights until I reached Mount Horeb, which is the mountain of God. When I finally reached Mount Horeb, I went into a cave there. And God said to me, what are you doing here, Elijah? I told God, I said, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant. They have broken down your altars. They put your prophets to death with the sword. And I'm the only one left. And they're out to kill me next. At that point, God revealed himself to me. He didn't reveal himself to me in the whirlwind or the earthquake or the fire. He came to me in a still, small voice. And once again, God, came, God said to me, he said, what are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing in a cave? I again gave God the same answer. And I guess you could say at that point that God recommissioned me under the ministry. God was able to get me out of my depression and to refocus my attention back upon ministry. You see, my, my focus had become upon myself. And God needed to refocus me toward the ministry. God told me to go to the desert of Damascus and anoint Haziel as king over Aram. He told me to also anoint Jehu, king over Israel, and to anoint Elisha to succeed me as God's prophet. Then God set the record straight. God reminded me that I wasn't all alone by myself in ministry. God had reserved 7,000 Israelites who had not compromised their faith and had not bowed down to Baal. Well, I did what God commanded me to. I, I anointed Haziel as king over Aram, Jehu as king over Israel, and Elisha to succeed me as God's prophet. Now, later on in King Ahab's reign, he wanted to switch vineyards with a man named Naboth because Naboth's vineyard was closer to his palace than what his was. And so Naboth, he didn't want to switch the vineyard because it was his family's inheritance. He said, it's been in my family for all these years. I can't trade, you, trade your vineyards. And so King Ahab, he began to sulk like a little child that doesn't get his or her way. His wife, Queen Jezebel, asked him what was wrong. And he told her, he said, Naboth refuses to trade vineyards with me. So she, in turn, devised a scheme which led to Naboth's death and to their confiscation of Naboth's vineyard. King Ahab got what he wanted. But as he went out to see Naboth's vineyard, God told me to go down and confront Nahab, King Ahab with Naboth's death. I knew this confrontation was not going to be pretty. 
because I was going to pronounce God's judgment that day upon both King Ahab and upon Queen Jezebel. Well, he, Ahab's response totally caught me off guard. When Ahab heard my words, he tore his clothes. He put on sackcloth and he lay and fasted. Several years later, King Ahab was killed during the war in Ramoth Gilead. Well, not only did King Ahab not like me, but neither did his son. Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, became king in Israel and Samaria, and he reigned in Israel only two years. Just like his dad, he served and worshipped Baal and provoked the Lord God to anger. King Ahaziah had fallen through the lattice in the upper room in Samaria, and he had injured himself really bad. But instead of Ahaziah turning toward God in the midst of his injuries, he sent messengers to consult Beelzebub, who was the god of Ekron, to see if he would recover from his injury. Well, again, God sent me to confront yet another king. I was to ask the messengers of King Ahaziah, who it was, was it because there was no god in Israel that you are sending your servants to Beelzebub to find out whether or not he would live or die? I told the messengers that God told me to tell them that he would not leave the bed that he was lying on, but he would certainly die right then and there. Well, these messengers went back to King Ahaziah, and they told him what I had said to him. The king said to him, what kind of man was it that appeared to you that day? And they responded, he was the kind of man that wears a garment of hair with a leather belt around his waist. I wasn't wearing my son to go to meetings that day either. I was, I was dressed in my old robe. But Ahaziah immediately knew that I was the one that had given them this message. King Ahaziah sent three different groups of 50 soldiers up to the top of the hill that I was sitting on. He thought he was going to command me to come down off of that mountain. But God destroyed the first two groups of 50 soldiers. But the captain of the third group of soldiers, he fell on his knees. He said, please don't kill me and my men like, like uh, God killed the other ones with fire. The angel of the Lord, who was the pre-incarnate Christ, said to me, Go down with him. Don't be afraid of him. So I went down to King Ahaziah, and he died just like he said he would die. You know, everything that God says is going to happen is going to happen. Well, because Ahaziah had no sons, Jehoram, Ahaziah's brother, succeeded him as king. King Jehoram reigned for 12 years, from 852 to 841 B.C., now, Jehoram wasn't quite as bad as what his, father, what his parents were. He actually removed the pillar of Baal that Ahab had erected, though he didn't give up the golden calf worship that had been started by King Jeroboam. Now, my dealings with the king, this king of Israel, are not recorded in the Bible. Now, here's where it gets a little confusing. You know how your church has two Johnnies in it? You have uh, John Waitman and you have John Yunus. Well, there are two Jehorams that were reigning at the same time. One was reigning in Israel and one was reigning in Judah. There was Ahaziah's brother Jehoram who was reigning in Israel and there was a king of Judah named Jehoram who was reigning at the same time in the land of Judah. And to make it even more confusing, these two Jehorams were related. The Jehoram that reigned over Israel was uncle to the Jehoram who reigned over the land of Judah. Well, I wrote a letter to King Jehoram who was ruling over the nation of Judah. Let me just summarize my letter to him. I told him, you've not been a very godly king. You led Judah and the people of Judah away from God. You, not, you even murdered your own brothers who are a lot better of a people than what you were. So now the Lord is about to strike your people, your sons, your wives, and everything that's yours with a heavy blow. And I told him, worse yet, you yourself is go are going to be very ill with a lingering disease of the bowels until this disease causes your bowels to come out. Well, let me tell you, God did exactly what he said was going to happen. You know, everything that God says is going to happen is going to happen. God stirred up the Philistines and the Arabs to attack the people of Judah. They carried off all of King Jehoram's possessions along with all of his sons and his wives, except the youngest son, who was Ahaziah. And after all that happened, God inflicted Jehoram with an incurable disease of the bowels. His bowels actually started to come out because of this disease. We're told that he died in absolutely agonizing pain. 
Now most kings back in my day, they were honored when they when they died. The people make a fire to uh, commemorate their death. But not even one person in the land of Judah commemorated the death of King Jehoram. He was 32 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem eight years. He passed away to no one's regret. Because he was king, he was buried in the city of David, but he was not buried in the tombs, along with the rest of the kings of Judah. Well, that pretty much ended my confrontation with these three kings. Let me tell you a little bit about the exciting accent of out of this life. Really reminds me in similar nature to what God says is going to happen to his church when Jesus returns to take his church out of this world. God had predicted that I was going to be taken out of the world this one particular day. Well, by that point in the ministry, I had been discipling Elisha to take over as the main prophet over the people of Judah. God had told me that Elisha would take over after I was gone. I sure hope that you folks especially you older folks, that you're discipling these younger followers of Christ so that they too can take over after you're gone out of the scene. We were on our way to Gilgal, and I told you, Elisha that God was sending me to Bethel. Now, I never insisted that Elisha follow me to Gilgal. I guess you could say I was testing his loyalty and his determination under the ministry. Elisha was not going to, be to stop following me. Regardless of where I went, Elisha followed me. It was really good to see someone that persistently followed the Lord and followed my steps. In that one day, we went to Bethel, then we went to Jericho, then we went to the Jordan River. When we came to the Jordan River, I took off my cloak, and I rolled it up, and I smacked the water with it. God parted the water just like he had done at the Red Sea when Moses put his staff out over it. When, they fled from, when the nation of Israel fled from the land of Egypt. Did the same thing as what he did with Joshua when he came to the Jordan River. He parted the river. Now, after we crossed the river, I said to Elisha, I said, what can I do for you before God takes me away? Without missing a beat. He must have given thought to it. He said, let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. Elisha was asking for double the courage and double the miracles of what God had given me. I told him that if he saw me taken out of his sight, that God would entrust to him a double portion of my spirit. As we were walking along during this conversation, out of nowhere, a chariot of fire and chariot of horses appeared and took me to heaven in a whirlwind. Kind of like what happens in, in the land of America when a tornado hit. Well, at that point, God took me and transported me into his presence. I sure do trust that every person in this room this morning, that they have a personal love relationship with Jesus Christ, so that if they were to die today, that they'd be just like me, taken right into the presence of God. There's several important lessons I hope you picked up on as I've been sharing my testimony this morning. First lesson I hope you didn't miss is that none of us should stop sharing the message that God has given to us. You may be afraid to share God's message with others, but don't allow your fears to stop you from sharing the greatest message on this earth, the gospel of Jesus Christ. If I can confront three wicked kings with their sins, you surely can confront people with the claim that Jesus Christ has upon their life. God may not call you to confront kings like what I did, but he does call each of us to confront others with the message of the gospel so that they can be saved. Telling others God's message requires courage. It requires telling people what they need to hear rather than what they want to hear. Second lesson, I hope you didn't miss, is that everything that God says is going to happen is going to happen. Every word that God said would happen in his timing. It did happen. When God told Joshua that if anyone rebuilt the walls, the, the city of Jericho, that they would lose their two sons, he meant it, and he did it. When God promised King Ahab that there wasn't going to be due of rain for the next couple of years, he did it. When God told King Ahaziah through me that he wasn't going to die, or that he was going to die, he meant it. When God told King Jehoram through me that he was going to take away all his possessions, God meant it. When God told King Jehoram that through me, through the message that I gave him, he would become very ill and that he would die from a lingering disease of the bowels. He meant it. 
everything that God says is going to happen is going to happen. You can rely upon this. God always fulfills his promises. It was God who said through King Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 56, Praise be to the Lord, not one word has failed of all the good promises that he gave through his servant Moses. I don't care how many promises you discover in the Bible, God is going to fulfill every one of them. God isn't like people today. Sometimes people will fulfill the promises, sometimes they won't. You can count on that. God will never let you down. As the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. The word amen means it is yes, true. Third lesson I hope that you didn't miss is we need to be discipling other people. We ought to teach others how to obey God and serve God. We ought to disciple others just like I discipled Elisha. Those of us who are older, we should be modeling to the younger generation, the young Elijahs, how they can serve God after we're out of the picture. Sure, it was a pleasure being with you this morning. I trust that you'll be encouraged in your relationship with God through the series that your pastor leads you into a study on my life, which is spoken of in the Bible. Let's close with a word of prayer. Precious Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you that even as the scriptures say, that even though people like Elijah are dead, their life continues to speak to us today. Lord, we thank you in advance for the way you will change our lives through the message of your word this morning. We pray that as we go forth from this building, that Lord God, we would truly honor and glorify you in all that we say and in all that we do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand as we sing our doxology.